Okay, I started the recording. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so last class, uh, uh, we went into gory details about uh, um, the WIMP dark matter. Uh, we actually did uh, uh, looked at uh, uh, how to uh, why dark matter should be WIMP. So if dark matter has some thermal origins, say for example, if it has thermal origins, like in a Big Bang uh, cosmology, then it, the most likely candidate it can be is essentially a wimp. Okay, you can have a, a non wimp also, but uh, <clears throat> uh, but most uh, meaning those uh, the deviations from non wimp would be not be very uh, uh, very substantial let me put it this way they won't be so there is this um, um, idea that uh, you can have wimp like miracle also with slightly different uh, um, uh, interaction strengths also uh, you can look at feng at all but it's not okay feng at all Okay, look at the paper, which is a non wimp like uh, miracle, which you can construct actually. That's not a problem actually. But in general, the, uh, the situation seems to be that uh, we have very, very strong constraints on thermal dark matter coming from um, uh, direct detection experiments because uh, WIMP, while it's very nice that it has this miracle in cosmology which gives you a very good dark matter candidate, uh, which fits their relic density so well, has very strong constraints at the same time coming from experiments, which are direct detection experiments, which are essentially, uh, uh, in which you have small DV, uh, meaning vibrations in the nuclei, which you are measuring essentially at the level of KEV or so. So this is what we have seen. And then we say that the standard model um, does not have a, a proper WIMP candidate. Okay. Now, in spite of these constraints, WIMP is still allowed. I'm not saying it's completely ruled out. And there are alternatives. Like uh, we, I mentioned a few of them, like uh, FIMS, Friesen, and uh, so on. So there are super heavy dark matters. And uh, so there are several alternatives for dark matter as of now. But within the standard model, none of the candidates, okay, uh, satisfy uh, within the standard model. We don't have any particle which can thermalize be stable over universe length scales, okay? Uh, it, uh, meaning it can thermalize, but it won't be stable. Simultaneously, it cannot do both the things, essentially. Okay, be stable. And uh, still be in the right range to satisfy and neutral also, okay, neutral to satisfy the experimental constraints. This, I think, is a pretty fair statement, I think. Uh, in spite of all the caveats and everything, uh, this is a pretty fair statement. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, I am not ruling out right hand neutrinos. Okay, if right hand neutrinos are not, are, are not a part of uh, standard model, this is a pretty pretty stable, uh, correct statement actually. One can say. Okay, we don't have anything, so we have to think of new particles. If you want to have dark matter, we have to think of some new particles. So whether it's a wave or any other mechanism, every other mechanism of my. Uh, uh, WIMP, uh, to add actually WIMPs is much easier, okay? 
I would uh, let me make this very provocative statement to add WIMS to standard model. It's much easier. Okay, but any other thing, okay, except maybe Higgs portal or something, any other thing requires extra structures actually, uh, like uh, freezing or anything would require extra structures. And unless you have additional symmetry, uh, so it's not easy. You have to really complicate it. Like, uh, the, every sim uh, there's no really simple model of dark matter. As long as there are only essentially toy models, actually, you can only consider toy models, but a full quantum field theory like models, unless if you are doing with a well oiled machinery like supersymmetry or extra dimensions, uh, all the rest of the uh, models are essentially effective field theories or toy models, which have not been explored at extremely great details. Uh, certain things like uh, there are some called. Uh, inert Higgs doublet models or something. Those are the kind of things which have been done at a detailed fashion, actually. But uh, to be fair, we can say that in of all the BSM models, uh, uh, supersymmetry and to a certain extent, extra dimensions are technically at a much superior level compared to any of the other models, even in dark matter physics, actually. And meaning they have been explored, there are many things are known you understand uh, all the interaction strengths and so on. Anyway, since we are discussing the problems within standard model, so to uh, we'll come to that when we come to supersymmetry, but to summarize essentially, this is the statement that we don't have any uh, particle which actually can fit a very nice uh, way, uh, uh, meaning the dark matter, give reasonable signatures and still satisfy the relative density. We don't have such candidate in, in standard model. So we need to think of some new extensions of standard model. So this is sort of uh, settles the dark matter issue. So this is the final statement as far as standard model is concerned. So now today, uh, any questions on dark matter, any comments or anything, anything which you want to say? Okay, so I'll move to uh, the next problem of the standard model, which is the so-called strong CP problem. Now, over the years, strong CP problem and axions has become so synonymous that we believe that axions are almost like a standard model solution to the strong CP problem. And so we believe that uh, axions are a part of the standard model particle spectrum, okay? Uh, but let's leave, leave that aside. Today, what we'll try to understand is what is actually the strong CP problem. To put it simply, um, and, uh, to put it simply, uh, let me put it this way, okay? I'll, uh, the way, then we'll go into the details actually. Uh, so to put it simply, uh, gauge invariance, this is a very, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, what I'm going to say is essentially a very heuristic argument, but then I'll, uh, I'll make it more concrete in the, in the, in the next few minutes, actually. So gauge invariance allows a term of the type theta g mu nu, g mu nu tilde in the QCD yang mills Lagrangian. Okay, this term is allowed in your uh, young men's Lagrangian. Okay, uh, so 
uh, now if you want you can put it uh, essentially as uh, okay let me write it more accurately so this will be some theta g square by 16 by square g mu g mu tilde what is g mu tilde g mu tilde is the dual tensor of g mu of g mu defined as <clears throat> this is exactly like f minute tilde but now remember but remember g menu is the field strength of non abelian gauge theory of non abelian gauge theories now what are the properties of this uh, so this is essentially one should add this term l to the lqcd lqd full is equal to lqcd plus this term so you should add this term to the lqcd No, this term you should add it. Okay. And now, what are the properties of this term? The main property of this term that it violates CP because it has an epsilon mean tensor sitting here, it violates CP. If theta is non zero okay now uh, the problem is uh, uh, qcd interactions are vectorial interactions and uh, uh, you don't they don't violate cp invariance they are cp exact Okay. Now, why should it be there? So, meaning for in all the QCD interactions, you don't see any violation in uh, uh, in CP. So, for all, uh, so you would expect one would expect this term to go into zero essentially. So, if this term is non-zero, phenomenological conditions. Okay, let just just to give you an idea. Uh, then, okay, let me. Uh, should I? Okay, I'll tell you phenomenologically. Suppose if this term is there, if this term is there, say for example, it will give you uh, all CP violating effects essentially, and the strongest CP violating effect you would expect is essentially in uh, um, say neutron electric dipole moment. Okay, so neutron electric dipole moment so electric dipole moments are a cp quality so dn is neutron electric dipole moment and in the presence of non zero uh, uh, theta so you would expect something like i don't know if i remember correctly 10 power minus 3 times theta Uh, I think I'm right actually, but uh, okay, maybe I'm orders of magnitude actually uh, a little bit. Uh, okay, so neutron, uh, so this gives me some numbers, okay, something like this. So, where does this come from? So, this comes from diagrams as follows essentially. So, you have neutron. then neutron and then there's a proton some box connecting essentially because it's an edm diagram so you'll have some bubble here okay so these bubbles okay you can write it in terms of and these bubbles can change you can put a bubble here 
can put a bubble here and so on and so on. And these are these dotted lines are pions essentially. You can have pion exchanges. This is like uh, uh, in your particle physics course or QM3 course, you do this Newton pion theory, right? Essentially, this Yukawa theory, um, chiral perturbation theory, or Yukawa theory. You, do. you can compute it within the neutrons will exchange pions, and the pions will go in loop. And then this pions, pions essentially, this term effectively tells you that you have an interaction coming from effective interaction coming from this term. This is essentially this uh, effective latter. So this will sit here, a uh, Gini Gini tilde, and this will give me a neutron electric dipole moment. But the problem is that this dipole moment comes out to be something like uh, dm experimentally. is I think uh, some one into one into 10 power minus 25 ECM roughly. Uh, and okay, oh, no, no, then I'm wrong. This is uh, some two into 10 power minus 10, I think. Okay, so the theory is if you compute it, should me give me a roughly equivalent to 2 into 10 power minus 10 times theta ECM. So the experiment gives me some number of the order of this one. And the theory, even if you take in all possible uh, uncertainties and so on, so this theory should gives me this number to be of the order of. Uh, Theta. Okay, theta time. Now this means theta should be equal to ten power minus ten. So there is some sort of an upper bound on theta that it should be one in uh, ten million. Okay, roughly. That, okay. No, no, not 10 million, 10 billion, okay? So it should be one in one part in 10, per 10, uh, 10 billion. So this is an extremely tiny quantity. Whereas, as far as theory is concerned, why it should, this, it should be so small is not clear because it's allowed by gauge theory. Now gauge theory allows this term actually. <clears throat> so, so this can be uh, as large as uh, order one theory claims it can be as large as order one. I'll come to this in one second, actually, why it should be large. Whereas uh, experiment puts a constraint on theta to be 10 power minus 10. So this is the strong CP problem that you can have a term of this particular thing. Okay, so let's see. Uh, so 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 these are the main points that you can have to write a term of this in your Lagrangian, and this Lagrange uh, this term should be order one from theory. So this is just a heuristic summary essentially. And this term violates CP. So in principle, strong interactions should violate CP because we think that only weak interactions violate CP. But here you have a term in your Lagrangian which tells you that strong interactions also should violate CP. But the violation of CP is so small, so small from experiments because you don't see any experimental consequences of this violation, uh, violation of strong interaction, uh, CP in strong interaction. It can be seen clearly from uh, neutron electric dipole movements and uh, they are extremely small of the order of 10 power minus 25. But from theory point of view, uh, the neutron electric dipole movement could be as large as 10 power minus 10. So 10 orders of magnitude should be, uh, 15 orders of magnitude should be more. Okay. Now, uh, is this convincing? Okay, I'm just claiming all this thing, but let me just go look a little bit uh, go into details essentially. 
of this term. Now, this term is a very interesting term, actually. Okay, this term. Now, if you look at uh, this term, okay, uh, this term was, I think, uh, first uh, because this term is related to. Uh, non-trivial vacuum structure of non-enabling gauge theories. <clears throat> now, what do you mean that? Being mean by that? Now, imagine now what you do generally. Uh, you write a Lagrangian, right? In general, let's say that I write a Yangman's Lagrangian. Yangman's. This will be some f mu one by four, f mu nu, f mu nu, and so on. So for abelian gauge theories, there will be some one by four or minus one by four, g mu nu, g mu nu, for non abelian gauge theories. Now, what do you expect is that when you are deriving from this, you derive the uh, uh, mu, say for example, and get the equations of motion. But when you are deriving the equations of motion, what you do is typically you neglect uh, something called the total derivative terms. Okay. So the reasoning behind the total derivative terms is that the fields vanish at x tends to infinity. Okay, that's the basic idea that uh, as x tends to infinity, as x mu tends to infinity, a mu goes to zero, or boundary condition is essentially f mu goes to zero. Okay, you'd say that okay, uh, these fields vanish. But what happens to gauge fields is in non abelian gauge fields, non abelian gauge fields do not vanish fastly as x tends to infinity. Because they have, uh, especially the classical solutions of them, do not vanish actually. Okay. <clears throat> so non abelian gauge theories <clears throat> gauge fields do not vanish fastly. This part everybody's we do it no in all right from classical mechanics everywhere when you are deriving equation of motion we assume this boundary condition. Okay, with this boundary condition. Now this boundary condition is not exactly correct when you are deriving for non abelian gauge theory because non abelian gauge fields do not vanish or vanish rapidly for x tends to infinity. Okay. So I think, uh, uh, so if you take pure, the example essentially is typically Bella win if you look at uh, Raja Raman or any of these books on topological solutions, the reason is that they have non trivial topological structures. Okay. They have non trivial solutions. So, so you hear these words no? non trivial vacuum non-trivial topological solutions, so on, so So that's precisely the reason. So what you can do is essentially, so if you take, uh, uh, say, for example, this Bellavin et al, what they showed is that if you take SU2 theory, forget about SU3, okay, SU2 theory, you take uh, simple SU2 theory, Pure gauge fields. That means you just have only take 
Young males of SU2, forget about matter. Okay, you take the Lagrangian of SU2. So something similar like to this. And <clears throat> you can, in the Euclidean space, Euclidean spaces you write instead of a, a minus one, you take one, 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 essentially. In the Euclidean space, you have new solutions. You have classical solutions. This will uh, essentially will turn out to be instant terms and so on. Classical solutions to the field equations. So the field equations are nonlinear. So you'll have some sort of, uh, so because these are nonlinear, you try to get some exact solutions for them. It's not easy, but you'll have in Euclidean space some solutions. From these solutions, you can actually show actually. <clears throat> You should have, so in the Euclidean space, what solution you have from this, you suggest that it tells you that there should be some other term in the Lagrangian. There should be an extra term in the Lagrangian, which is of the form which is of the form Minus some g square, okay, 16 pi square sort of thing. Trace uh, w mu nu, w mu nu tilde. So you should have an f mu nu, f mu nu type, tilde type term in the, this thing. Now, typically what you say, this f mu nu, f mu nu tilde, the trace of it, is essentially a total derivative. Okay. <clears throat> so you can ask the question what happens in a classical, I mean, uh, you QED, right? Why this term you won't write in QED? In QED, yes, you do write and it leads to idioms. But you don't have this question, uh, you don't ask the same question because in non abelian gauge theories, this plays an important role actually because it doesn't play any, uh, it's not as a, uh, in EDMs and everything, in QED, uh, there are no uh, classical solutions, okay? Okay, but in non abelian gauge theories, you have all these classical solutions. Actually, the moment you put in standard model, it becomes much more complicated actually, and so on, so. Okay. So, now this term, if you look into it, this is trace w mu nu, w mu nu tilde is, like I said, epsilon mu nu lambda, some this thing, some, I'll write it in terms of some k mu, okay. Um, trace, so this is a total derivative, some a field nu <coughs> lambda, a sigma plus 2g a nu a lambda a sigma. So this is, if when expressed in terms of the gauge fields, this gives you this particular fashion. This is this form. Now I have not put uh, gauge field uh, um, indices because uh, I absorb them into this. So for example, what I said here is here a new, I absorb the gauge index in terms of summed over all the gauge field indices. So lambda alpha by two, a mu alpha. So I summed over all the gauge field indices when I wrote this term. Okay.
so this uh, no what i'm trying to do is that this term what i'm trying to argue that this term is a total derivative but should not play in any role in uh, so it should not have any physical effect but it can be shown that this has solutions and these solutions are different actually these solutions are different depending upon something called the topological quantum number so this is equivalent to some del mu some k mu let's say that k mu so this k mu is essentially rest of the things except for the del mu so the rest of the things which are there so what happens is you can express this entire solutions of this equation in terms of some quantum number respect to with respect to gauge field is equal to g square by 16 pi square sum over all surface del mu for x del mu k mu now the point here is that there is for everything for uh, so this essentially becomes now you can say it as some g square by 16 pi square some instead of a surface integral you write it in terms of space integral so d cube so what it means that these solutions are over some surface in this case s3 okay so you take slices of uh, if you want uh, s3 self uh, surface s3 is essentially a sphere okay a uh, topological sphere and so for these solutions you get some solutions and these solutions are not equivalent so these depend upon something called for each value of uh, say for each topological value so if you want uh, uh, the, the, uh, this essentially is called an instant on so this is called an instant on number for each instant on number number or sometimes it's also called i never know how to spell this actually pontiagra Yeah, green. Okay, index. Okay, for each of this number, this solution changes essentially. So the solutions is different. So gauge fields, because at uh, when you so the gauge fields at the classical level or at the vacuum have different solutions, different inequivalent solutions corresponding to each. slice of s3 you take if you want each slice of s3 will be completely different essentially so if you want to specify this is my solution of the uh, um of my classical gauge field equations okay <clears throat> you can say that uh, you had to then uh, but then you had to specify what is its topological number at the class. so that means so this is my instant on number or it is uh, uh, this index ponte pontry pontry again index this is for this index this is my solution so at the vacuum there is no unique solution for su3 young mills theory so the classical solutions of su3 or even for any non abelian gauge theory the classical solutions of SU, uh, or non abelian gauge theories are not unique they are gauge equivalent they are they are dependent upon which to topological <coughs> index you take <coughs> so each of them corresponds to one different vacuum now for gauge fields what do you say which is the vacuum which is the classical action you want to say okay Uh, so this instant on uh, so for a set of instant on numbers which is called also called homotopy class actually 
Okay. You can, uh, so, so these vacuum, if you want this vacuum, this bunch of vacuum. So at the, at the classical level, you start, you have multiple solutions. Okay. Let me just try to see it diagrammatically. I don't know if it's possible. You have multiple solutions, which are gauge inequivalent, each depending upon some mu. So new is equal to one, new is equal to two, new is equal to three, new is equal to four, new is equal to five. So each of them is a different solution. Solution. So it's not gauge inequivalent. Okay, they are uh, they are not. If you change of it gauge, essentially you cannot move from it. So these different solutions. So that means the vacuum of non-abelian gauge theories is completely uh, non-trivial. That means there is no single vacuum for non-abelian gauge theories. There are multiple vacuum for non-abelian gauge theories. This you must have heard it as sometimes people call it as theta vacuum. Uh, so, yeah. So this uh, new values, I mean this instant instant on number. Uh, yeah. I mean it depends on this S three slice that we are integrating. Right. I mean. Right. Right. Okay. So okay. So that that is the instant on number, and then for each yeah. of them you have different solution new of a. Yeah. So okay. uh, each each of them is an S three configuration. Okay. But then. Uh, the, the corresponding slice is different. The corresponding slice is different. Okay. 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 All of them are S3 only. Mm -hmm. There's only S3 which is allowed for that gauge theory, essentially. Okay. But there are multiple solutions allowed which are not which are different depending upon the topology of S3. Essentially, what are the uh, um, the instant on number depending upon uh, say all these class of solutions have an index a number topological number. Okay, which are inequivalent. This okay. class of solutions are inequivalent. They're not of the same, they don't have the same gauge. You cannot move from one uh, one gauge to another uh, another solution by some gauge transformation. Okay. Okay. So if you want, you can write them as some, imagine that you can write them as some e power i n theta times n. Okay. So as n changes, this also changes. Okay, so this is actually you represent the vacuum as this fashion actually. You represent it as some n e power i, uh, I think n, n. Okay, so you can, uh, okay, you can, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, you can represent the theta vacuum in this particular fashion. So all possible uh, vacuum. So as n takes different values, okay, as n takes different values. So this n is also called the homotopy class. Okay, this is called the homotopy class. <coughs> okay, so you have this multiple vacua. Uh, each of them have a different topological index. Uh, and now you put them all together. So one particular configuration of vacuum, this is the configuration, theta vacuum is different. Con so you, you take, uh, okay. These are different solutions. So the general solution, maybe I should say solution is a linear combination of all of them. Okay, now if there is a linear combination, so you have one configuration of this uh, topological numbers and you take linear combination, but then there will be another configuration. Then there is an another configuration. So for different values of this new. So all this can be represented as different configurations of one uh, as a single quantity called 
uh, a theta state in which you can express it in this particular fashion. So the first, uh, the nth vacuole. So this is the number of the vacuole. So for example, n nth vacuole will have some number here. So second vacuole will have another number. So n can be say, for example, any integer, zero, plus minus one, plus minus two, so on. So plus minus one essentially. So this will cor correspond to the topological number essentially the top of uh, what do you call the uh, instant on number okay so uh, so for a class of instant on numbers you have a, uh, some if you want i put it okay, uh, as i am trying to make it as simple as possible for a class of an <coughs> instant of number an instant on numbers you will have this uh, Class means uh, one collection of instant on numbers, set of instant on numbers. Uh, you will have this linear combination, quote unquote, linear combination of all possible vacua. Because, see, each vacua can take any configuration, right? There, there exists several vacua. And then the most general solution is the linear combination of this vacua. But suppose if I number all these vacua as n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, n is equal to 3, and so on. So, in some cases, n can have new value one. In another cases, n can have new value two. N can have new, th uh, uh, the first one can have new is equal to one or the first one can have new is equal to two and so on so. Okay. I don't know, uh, you got it, right? Uh, did, did you understand it? So the n can take uh, for e, the n, it says n is the, uh, the vacuum number, say for example. Okay, so what I did was the, each solution I'm calling it as one vacuum, but I'm labeling it. I'm taking a linear combination of them. <clears throat> and then I'm saying that instead of uh, these solutions, I'm writing in terms of this homotopy class, or, or writing in terms of some index N, which will be related to this topological uh, number. This will be related to some topological number. So this topological number keeps changing because you can have solution to one, new is equal to one. But as I said, in other words, the first vacuum can have new is equal to one and the rest of them can have so and so. Second, uh, the sec first vacuum can also have new is equal to two and so and so. So all such possibilities are allowed essentially. You can just think that it is, it's like, like a statistical send of scenario essentially. So we can have many such theta. Uh, you can have many such theta vacuum. You can have many such theta vacuum. Okay. You are right actually. So there are many such theta vacuum. Here I have represented only one. Okay. Now, the theta vacua can move from uh, one, so you can actually show that you can have a theta to theta transition. <clears throat> so if this is one vacua, so you can have multiple vacua like this, multiple vacua, arbitrary number of vacua. Okay, so uh, they, you should, Imagine that there is some gauge transformation U, which takes from one vacua of class, homotopy class one. Uh, homotopy class means one set of, uh, say, instant on numbers, say, for example, to another set of instant on numbers where n is replaced by n plus one, say, for example, or n is replaced by n plus capital N, so on, so. <coughs> so, uh, now you cannot say what is the true vacuum. You cannot say what is a true vacuum essentially. But what you can do is you can actually calculate um, um, some vacuum to vacuum transitions. Say imagine that there is another vacuum, theta prime, which is some um, same thing, some more n 
if you write theta prime n, n. So this is another configuration. Okay. And in between them, so end to end, there will be some uh, end, uh, uh, end to say, for example, vacuum n, there could be a vacuum n plus one, there could be another gauge transformation. So these are gauge equivalent. So you can have some gauge transformations and so on and so on. But if you have vac uh, transitions between theta and theta prime, say for example, so this theta e power minus ht, so if you compute this theta to theta transitions, <clears throat> you can derive something called uh, uh, effective action from this. So you can, so what is this effective action? So this theta to theta transitions Sorry, this should be some n plus new. <laughs> so, like I said, you can have uh, so one vacuum to another vacuum, there could be some transitions. And you'd expect that uh, um, you can construct some sort of an gauge transformation, okay? Uh, which will not be the same. Uh, uh, so say for example, you uh, you and okay, some gauge transformation. Uh, to another one, but if you want to jump, so one set of gauge trans, uh, so uh, okay, uh, I don't know. Uh, now there is a big step from coming from uh, so okay. These classical solutions, imagine that. Okay, new one is equal to two, new is equal to three, new one is equal to three. These things are gauge in equivalent. So you fix a gauge to certain value for each of them, say for example. So each lead to one particular solution depending upon this S3. But then because all these things are related, like I said, they're gauge in equivalent. No? But you can construct another gauge transformation, which can move from one set of vacua to another set of vacua. You can actually construct one gauge transformation to one set of vacua to another set of vacua. So this is the key. The basic idea is that, that that tells you that you can represent this vacua in this particular fashion. That tells you that you can represent this them as some phase factors. That's how you represent them as some phase factors. Now you can compute your vacuum to vacuum transitions. You can actually compute your vacuum to vacuum uh, transitions. Now, you uh, now say for example, from for, for an arbitrary vacuum n plus new, say for example, going to n vacuum to vacuum transitions. So you can actually these are transmitted if you want by instantons. Okay. Then you replace, uh, now you can derive an S matrix uh, H by L, okay? You replace H by L and you can derive an effective field, effective uh, Lagrangian.
So this transition plus nu n plus nu e power minus hd to nu is nothing but some effective action corresponding to new solution e power minus d power 4 x l. <coughs> so, but then this you have to transform uh, everything, right? Essentially, because we have theta e power minus theta prime t power minus s d to theta is equal to delta theta minus theta prime. Some or all possible new integral d a mu e power minus d power four x l i theta nu theta nu i okay let me write it theta prime e power minus h t theta is equal to that the theta prime minus theta sum over all nu integral d a mu nu e power minus integral d power 4x l and this is your generator okay now this gives you if you derive this effective Lagrangian this L effective of A is equal to L A plus theta G square plus 16 pi square trace F mu F mu. Okay, so what I tried to show is uh, suppose I start with a Lagrangian, I start with a Lagrangian, which is just this. Okay, which is just f mini f mini uh, f mini without considering f mini uh, uh, um, uh, without considering the tilde term. Okay, what happens is there are some solutions. There are some solutions which are classical solutions, okay, which are classical solutions. So, which uh, uh, which are essentially instant on solutions, <clears throat> and these instant on solutions, what do they do? They they correspond to each of these instant on solutions correspond or instant on uh, corresponds to different kinds of vacua different kind of vacua or uh, depending upon the instant on number or something called the ponty pontry again index so these solutions corresponds to different vacua different vacua so there are this uh, depending upon the instant on number there is some classical field uh, classical field solutions which correspond to different uh, vacua which are gauge nearly equivalent that means they don't have the same gauge fixing essentially they don't have the same gauge fixing they don't have the same gauge fixing so but now what you can do is you can write depending i, I didn't go into homotopy and um, just look at uh, um, there are several nice uh, lectures by weinberg uh, one book's quantum field theory book actually okay uh, okay uh, that's your good reference so uh, when he talks about homotopy classes and so on so uh, okay uh, so you can re-express your vacua in terms of uh, in terms of uh, these classical solutions each correspond to one classical solutions but then in terms of integers corresponding to some homotopy class and these integers can go from 0, 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 2, minus 2, so on. So this will correspond to this n will roughly correspond to the homot uh, the 
the instant on number essentially or uh, <clears throat> uh, or uh, the for the index essentially contra yagin index okay so if i represent this and then i look for uh, another configuration of the uh, vacuum which i call theta prime but this theta prime can be nothing but theta plus some arbitrary number n okay some arbitrary number n new and then this uh, theta prime can be because all of them are uh, uh, are connected by some gauge trans you can always build some kind gauge transmission from between n to n plus 1 actually i should be more careful so uh, what happens is if you have so each half n to n plus 1 will be u power n and if you keep increasing let's say for n plus new it will be some u power n power new so this will be your gauge transformation which connects to uh, n the vacuum to n plus new the vacuum so your gauge transformation is so on so so this is the crucial point that's the reason why we, we represent the theta, theta vacuum in this particular fashion okay so the theta vacuum will be so a bunch of states it essentially is a bunch of states which are represented in this particular exponential by which are different by a phase factor and by n that's all we should remember the theta vacuum are essentially a bunch of states uh, which are all possible states where the for each homotopy class you can take this n integer to be 0 plus minus half plus minus 1 plus minus 2 and so on so given this theta vacuum as is okay given this each of this theta vacuum states now i can construct uh, the transition amplitude between the two uh, theta vacua this i can represent it in terms of um, fields because i can write an effective lagrangian in this particular fashion okay and i derive an effective lagrangian totally at the end of the day in this particular so the instant on transitions between different vacua in the QCD theory will give me F mu nu, F mu nu tilde term, the classical instant on vacuum transitions. So that's the basic point I'm trying to make essentially. Now, so this is the, the point is that so you say that okay i neglect this total derivative term i don't care about it when i start my lagrangian that is fine but the classical level these term will be there at the effective qcd lagrangian this term is generated and though your uh, your uh, uh, qcd interactions at the perturbity level do not break cp invariance at the non perturbity level, which means I, where I mean uh, these inter, instant on like solutions in the QCD vacuum, they break, C, they break CP in millions. Okay, they break CP invariance, and that is the reason why you this term is always generated in your Lagrange. <clears throat> this term is always generated in the Lagrange. So the non-perturbative effects in QCD break CP invariance and this term is generated in the Lagrangian at the effective limit. Um, 
no okay now now you can take this seriously okay you know earlier i when i mentioned the heuristic term that okay this term is allowed by so these earlier arguments that gauge invariance allow this term of the type g minu g minu tilde so i can write this term and so since there is no symmetry which protects this term i can take it to be order 1 so on so arguments they don't sound as curious i mean uh, they they may not sound as convincing to you okay that the cp uh, meaning the strong cp problem is actually pretty serious but now you know that because of the non trivial vacuum structure of non abelian gauge series even if i don't consider this term even if i don't consider this term from gauge invariance even if i set it to zero initially this term can be generated at the effective level while you take into consideration vacuum vacuum transitions between <coughs> uh, various possible qcd vacuum okay uh are you guys convinced any questions so the same will be true for su2 or i mean weak so, interactions so you have other interactions actually okay okay but then uh, in the su2 case they get mixed with uh, higgs hmm those solutions are different they are called uh, spelleron solutions okay okay but there are also uh, in the case of q2 you have the instant on solutions uh, in the su2 the gauge because of the um mixture of the um the gauge and uh, the higgs uh, fields because they are uh, they are coupled with each other okay mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> as you know that uh, in the pure su2 has this solutions by the way okay in the pure su2 i think the first solutions were found in pure su2 if you look at raja ramas book you will give the examples of belavin and company and then they have been exploited by two fifth and company to su3 uh, but in the standard model what happens is because of the spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, at the broken level uh, the higgs and the gauge fields get mixed mm. so the solutions are slightly complicated actually okay, okay. so those are, those are, those solutions are also mixed agreed yeah Uh, but the the vacuum structure is much more problematic in qcd uh, rather than for uh, uh, for the standard model because in the standard model anyway the gauge symmetry is broken it's only unbroken at the quantum level at the classical level the gauge symmetry is broken here the gauge symmetry is unbroken <clears throat> yeah that is the main distinction uh The, all these theta vacuum are related to each other by gauge symmetry. Here, the gauge symmetry is unbroken. It's just that they are for different gauges. Okay, of the okay, uh, the different okay. gauge values. Okay, mm-hmm. in the standard model, gauge symmetry is already broken. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> But if you take a pure SU two theory, imagine that I don't care about the standard model or something mm-hmm. without the Higgs. This exists in a pure SU two theory also. If you write a pure S U two theory without breaking or something conserved S U two, the theta vacuum exists. Okay. Yeah. So that's the reason why we don't talk about theta vacuum in standard model, but we talk about theta vacuum only for S U two. Now, there is one uh, last subtle point here. Um, Um, in the standard model, the Higgs uh, gauge field configuration, classical solutions are called spellerons. Okay, uh, and there are also topological solutions. There are also which transform from one to another. Okay. Yeah, I I'll talk about it maybe uh, today only at some point actually. Uh, no, maybe not be today. I think it's already twelve thirty eight. Yeah, maybe in the next class. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. so there is one more subtle point in this uh, qcd uh, strong cp problem so what we 
tried to show was that uh, the, this term f mini f mini tilde which breaks cp from theory point of view should be order one but exponential point of view is should be very very small but this f mini f mini tilde is actually related to something called the um, um <coughs> chiral anomaly <coughs> This we have seen that uh, the solutions, uh, uh, the chiral uh, currents are not conserved. Okay. Uh, the chiral currents are not conserved, but uh, uh, at the quantum level, unless you satisfy some anom anomaly conditions, right? Essentially, the anomaly term. And this anomaly term. Uh, is corresponds to f mini f mini tilde. I think when I considered when I wrote about anomalies, uh, when we talk, discussed anomalies in the class, we mentioned this actually. <clears throat> in the QCD, uh, the Karen anomaly is corresponds to J mu phi sigma. This is the J mu current, uh, uh, the Carroll current, Q A bar gamma mu gamma phi. QI. Now, <clears throat> this current is not conserved. As we have discussed, that it's not conserved but has an anomaly now uh, this current is only true okay i am assuming let's take uh, uh, okay just to revise ourselves uh, uh, if in the limit all quark masses are zero So there exist vector currents as well as uh, chiral currents. No, if you remember correctly, both of them are conserved. Okay, but this current is not conserved. The actual vector current is not current conserved, and this has an anomaly. That's what we remember that the chiral, uh, the vector chiral current is always conserved, but the uh, or if you write it in terms of the left and right, L plus R. L minus R, okay. You have these uh, two conditions. You can re express this element as V plus A. Okay, let's let me revise a little bit. Uh, consider the limit. Uh, All quarks are massless. In that case, you can have a chiral symmetry. Okay. <clears throat> and the chiral symmetry has, you can write the currents of the total QCD symmetry can be rep represented as vectorial plus actual vector currents. Uh, I'll do it, uh, um, maybe I didn't do it in class, I don't, uh, I don't remember. Uh, I'll do it again, maybe when we do composite Higgs, I'll do it in great detail. Okay, let me just take, just take it as a granted from this. And that this symmetries, these are U3 symmetries which can be decomposed into <coughs> SU3 times U1. So the U1 axial is not conserved, but has an anomaly. But has an anomaly, okay? Uh, this is related to some eta prime problem and so on. So. Uh, 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 the 
uh, okay. Uh, just take it for my granted that this is related to eta prime. So this has a solution in, again in terms of instant tons and so on. So. I will do it in greater detail when we come to composite Higgs's and so on. So, okay. So the basic idea here is that if you have um, just uh, just to give you some background, uh, I'll cover it in greater detail again. Uh, in the limit, all the quarks are massless. You can take the lightest three quarks, U, D, and S, and write corresponding, uh, then the QCT Lagrangian is invariant actually. You know, remember that I told you that uh, yeah. if we set the masses to zero, the Lagrangian is same for all the three generations. So let's just take only the three light quarks. Then there is an additional, because uh, the QCT Lagrangian is written for quark, each quark, it doesn't distinguish the SU2 structure. So you can write SU, SU3 flavor symmetry. This we discussed, I think, in the class, flavor symmetry. This flavor symmetry, when it is broken, it gives you Goldstone bosons. And these Goldstone bosons correspond to your pions, so on. So, okay. So, if you have a SU2 flavor symmetry, you have, imagine that I have a SU2 flavor symmetry, a SU2 flavor symmetry, which is nothing but the isospin. So, you have only have U and D. So if you rotate uh, U and D, both left and right. So this gives you the three pi ohms because it's a pi zero, pi plus, and pi minus. If you have SU3, SU3 flavor symmetry, this you must have studied in your <coughs> particle physics course. It gives you rest of the pi ohms, meaning you have the octet and uh, so on. So. Now the point is that, uh, these, when you write these flavor currents, essentially, these flavor currents can be written decomposed, uh, meaning in terms of JMU in this particular fashion. Okay, vectorial times actual vector currents. So, in principle, you can gauge one of these currents. You can gauge one of them, but you cannot gauge the actual vector current because actual vector current is not conserved. It's not conserved, so you cannot gauge it. So, but it has an anomaly. And the anomaly, as I have mentioned, that all the anomalies have the same form. I think it has the form. This is the standard form which we have, or G mini G mini to know. Now, this has the same form. This is the number of quarks, number of quark flavors. This has the same form as we have discussed earlier. Now, what is surprising is this has the same form as the theta termos. Okay. This has the same form as the theta term. <clears throat> so what you can assume, okay? What you can do is, let me play a trick. <clears throat> let me do a trick. What I'll do is, I will say, I'll define a new JMU tilde is equal to JMU phi, which is this JMU this JMU, okay, minus 2NF, 
g square by 16 pi square. But now, f mini, f mini tilde, I wrote it in terms of k mu, right? I'll use this k mu. So this will have a generator, okay? This will have a generator. But then this generator will keep changing with respect to different new, okay? With respect to different new, okay? Some new will be changing, okay? This will have a generator, okay? You know that there are different news. So, but let me be there. So you have some Q5 tilde. It's called Q5 minus two and the new. So what I did, what I'm trying to say essentially is that this term, this term, I can make a chiral rotation of the quark fields. I can make a chiral rotation of the quark fields in the massless limit. In the massless limit, one can make a chiral rotation of the quark fields and absorb the theta term into the anomaly term of the action. This is the solution. So what I have told you is that if at least one of the quarks is massless, if at least one of the quarks is massless, I can absorb this theta term into the definition of uh, the axial anomaly, okay, into the axial anomaly terms, okay, and then I can get rid of the theta term completely in the Lagrangian, even though it is generated by, okay, even though it's generated by uh, instant on effects or whatever it is, and it will not have any observable effects. So it's equivalent to setting theta is equal to zero. So our main problem is theta is non-zero, right? Essentially, the theta need not be zero, but experimentally it is showing that it should be zero. So one of the solutions for the strong, uh, CP problem, because it's a theoretical problem, we had to find a theoretical solution, is to set massless quarks, okay? Essentially, if there is a massless quark, okay? Theta term can be absorbed away. <clears throat> but let me ask you this question. Is this solution consistent? Is there a massless quark in standard model? No. So the answer is no. So people try to make uh, from, uh, from lattice also, we don't have anything, but people try to make this work. Okay, uh, but as far as uh, we can see, there is no massless quark because even from lattice, from lattice also, there is no expectation that one of the quarks is massless. So what we have seen is that the simplest solution, 
the simplest solution for the strong CP problem doesn't work. That's sitting in the master or not the quarks to be going to see. So the other solution is called axions, which I'll discuss when I discuss axions. Essentially. So any questions on the strong CP problem? So the strong CP problem to summary is that the theta term should be order one. Okay. Uh, theoretically, you would expect it to be order one. Okay. Uh, or uh, small, uh, meaning uh, to be large, uh, but it will have strong observational consequences, especially in the neutron medium, which is very close to zero. Okay, the neutron medium is very close to zero <clears throat> of the order of 10 power minus 25. Whereas theory tells you that it could be as large as 10 to 15 orders of magnitude larger. So you want to, and even if you try to set it to zero, this term gets generated by instant on effects in the effective Lagrangian. And this term is also related to the actual anomaly. And in the limit, uh, if you have one massless quark, at least one massless quark, you can try to make it to be, uh, what do you call, uh, you can try to get rid of this, uh, this problem. Okay, so you need to go beyond standard model. The, you need to go to the beyond standard model. Okay, to um, um, explain the strong CP problem. And the solution is simple. Extend axial anomaly for massive quarks imposing additional symmetry. Again, you impose another additional symmetry, but this is not the same U1 of the QCD, an extra symmetry you impose. Okay, but for massive quarks, not in the case of massless quarks. So you impose an extra massive quarks. And this requires additional Higgs bosons. And this symmetry needs to be broken. And the pseudo Goldstone boson of that symmetry is essentially axions. Axions as pseudo Goldstone bosons of this extra symmetry okay so we will come to this when we discuss uh, actions because um, uh, right now we're only discussing the problems with standard model okay so we'll discuss alps I meaning actions as well as alps when we come to solutions actually so but i'm just giving an outline the outline is essentially that this action anomaly, uh, action anomaly current uh, is only for massless quarks in the standard model. But if you impose an extra uh, U1 symmetry, extra U1 symmetry, but that requires extra Higgs boson and uh, extra particles, okay, for massive quarks. And this additional symmetry uh, should be broken. And this, when it is broken, it has a pseudo Goldstone boson, and that Goldstone boson is nothing but action. So that's where. I'll stop here. Uh, so there is one solution, but there could be several solutions of this. And uh, actions have a very rich phenomenology and uh, a very rich, uh, very rich uh, model building actually. So this extra symmetry is sometimes called U1 pitch sequence. U1 pitch sequence after Roberto Pichai and Helen Green. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, sir. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So in this uh, limit, when you have uh, defined this uh, theta phi with a different, I mean, when you are absorbing in the GMU. Yeah. Last last term, when you define theta phi as two minus, uh, so theta phi minus two nf. So this will also vanish. So in this case, the transition of vacuum transition, what we are doing, theta to theta plus nu. So that term will also vanish in this case. Uh. 
so no the point is that now you uh, uh, the vacuum to vacuum transitions okay so you are asking when this term is generated came you it can get generated see vacuum to vacuum transitions will be there the term is generated but the term will be now related to as a part of the qcd for each vacuum transition of the order of the home, some homotopic class or some instant on number it will be equivalent to the qcd uh, qcd anomaly actually now okay and this will only work in the limit when of the mass uh, uh, when of the quarks is massless okay okay it will get related it will be just related to the qcd anomaly which will be by definition small essentially okay so the number of okay by definition by small so you can always observe this so this term will not have observable consequences because it will be related to the anomaly okay meaning large observable consequences because you are observing within the anomaly current you can observe it within the anomaly current actually um so there will be some uh, so whatever effects which will be generated okay are expected to be small proportional to the uh, uh masses of these quarks i don't know if i um the solution works like this you assume that uh, the quarks are massless and this term is rotated away from your lagrangian so the term is not generated so even if it is generated for every new value okay for every new value you rotate it away from your lagrangian so it will not have any observable effects so the only observable effects you would have are when this actual anomaly is broken okay which will be by the masses of these quarks okay but that is not okay that we will see so actually this is also a problem even with actuals okay okay if it is exactly so you say that okay there is no strong cp problem at all because the term is not there in the because the term is related to the qcd anomaly and so you don't have the term at all the problem is if the term is there so even if the term is generated for every vacuum to vacuum transition for each vacuum to vacuum transition i can rotate it away in the chiral anomaly for every quote on quote uh, instant on number so it will not have any observable consequences so it's essentially zero uh, i don't know you got the answer yes sir. i got the idea yeah, yeah. okay um, today i wanted to cover another topic but this itself took a long time i wanted to cover baryon asymmetry also so but at least i i hope i i convinced all of you that strong cp is a problem okay okay i hope all of you are convinced that theoretically a uh, strong cp is actually a, an issue okay uh, uh, you cannot uh, get rid of it okay <clears throat> and so you need to find solutions uh either whatever way you want essentially that uh, either by imposing some new uh, kinds of symmetry uh, symmetries like in axioms or uh, uh there are other solutions but there are two main solutions which are axioms and uh, which were first uh, proposed by these people and then they fully developed by jinni kim so there are two popular models of axioms we will consider both these models actually so uh, they go under the way uh, some two names are that two big acronyms and both these acronyms depend upon uh, how the axioms couple to fermions okay 
So that's precisely what we look into when we study axion. Okay, we will do both of them. So, okay. Uh, now, uh, what I'll do is, okay, I need to do, uh, I wanted to do baryon anti baryon asymmetry also before going to models. Uh, that is the last uh, uh, problems of the standard model which we'll do. So I'll do it in the next class, okay? I'll do it on Tuesday, okay? And then uh, we'll start doing either supersymmetry or extra dimension, so whatever you like, but we can do supersymmetry. Okay, but we will do it fast. Okay. Yeah. Any questions on today's class? Okay. Okay. Then. Uh, yeah. Thank you.